Well, thank you for thank you for in, inviting me. Uh, if I just do that, can you see that better? There we go. Um, yeah, my name is Tom Keeley. I'm I'm somewhere. I'm not an architect. Um, I am kind of a historian. Um, I do kind of do kind of design work. I can't design you a house. I trained in landscape architecture. I use photography, but I'm not a photographer. Um, and I think it's kind of come together in what I've been calling more recently you know, a, a topographic practice that is that blurs architecture and landscape that's interested in research, but it's a practice based research that comes out with a series of outputs that respond to the site itself. So that being that the approach, my kind of approach from lurking about in various locations, in this case, the border in Ireland, um, uh, would lead to a certain number of um, outcomes that I can't determine at the start necessarily and that are led by the place and the histories and the geographies and the sites themselves. Now, oh, is that? you all, uh, I assume, maybe I shouldn't assume it, if I uh, know um, where Ireland is. Um, here is a map of Ireland and um, here is the border between the north and the south. Now this, my interest in the border, I guess, began probably about, I don't know, 12 years ago. I was working for a gallery in London and um, we were about to do this project in Derry um, that didn't end up happening in the end, or not, not under my watch. Um, and I went to this bookshop in Derry called Foil Books, which is this amazing secondhand bookshop right by um, the walls. And uh, I picked up this book um, by Comte Bean and uh, it's called Bad Blood, A Walk Along the Irish Border. And I read it and I was really kind of captivated by it. Um, I didn't really know why. I didn't really, I knew I wanted to kind of work with it somehow. Um, that somehow didn't really take shape until about, I don't know, eight years later when, I, when it kind of, kind of coalesced into this PhD. Um, I mean, before that, I had a relationship with Ireland. Um, my dad's family um, are all from actually very near um, the Hugh Lane. They're from uh, Summer, Summer Hill, Summer Hill Parade, and also Upper Buckingham Street, just behind Connolly. So I was used to going to Ireland. I had a, an understanding, even as one that was from growing up in England, of the place, but we never went to the border. The border, was, this was in the 80s and 90s when we'd come over in the summers. and. It, 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 was, it was always over there or somewhere you heard about on the news. It was never someone I'd been to, where, somewhere I'd been to. Um, but I felt um, interested in understanding it somehow, perhaps in some form to understand, I don't know, my own relationship with Ireland, perhaps in some form to understand, um, I mean, growing up in the 90s and then through the, the peace process in, in Birmingham, um, I mean, I was very aware of the changes that kind of went on, um, even at distance. And I was kind of really keen, uh, wanted to understand, by the time I began to actually do the work on this project, um, it had been almost a generation. Like there were, there were kids um, who were born in 98 were now becoming adults. They, they, they'd lived in a, in a time when there had been no um, of violence or not, not, in, not in the same way. And I was interested about following things like these kind of the, the Good Friday Agreement or even the single market, like what, if you couldn't see the border anymore, if, you, if, if in the landscape it didn't have this kind of tangible, visible thing in a way, um, well, how did you know it was there and what did it mean? How did it kind of impact um, and did anyone care? Um, so I mean, previously to this, I'd been working um, with like printed matter a lot. Um, I had a background in making fanzines. Um, um, I worked for different galleries on exhibitions, but this was really kind of a way of me kind of doing something really drawn out and kind of messy in some ways um, and difficult um, and really getting to understand a, a place um, over a, kind of a much, much longer period. Um, I think when I began, I thought it would be this kind of uh, quite romantic, uh, <laughs> Uh, restaging of Col to Beam's uh, walk along the border, which was in, uh, in 86, 87, shortly after the anglo irish Agreement. And obviously that was in a very different kind of set of circumstances. Um, I, I guess and, and it would be like yet another man doing the solo male walk. I mean, I think 
it was really good that that didn't happen in the end. Um, but what really changed very fundamentally from me applying to do, to do this, what this work, this piece of study, until me starting it, was the elephant in the room, which is Brexit. Now, on that vote in um, June 2016, the kind of the political, the constitutional, the cultural, the practical ground on which I was kind of proposing a whole project um, shifted um, dramatically. And a lot of the first part of me um, doing the work was kind of me really trying to wrangle with Brexit. I think I was probably still shell-shocked and devastated by the vote itself. Um, and gradually, as I've gone through it, it's, it's more, I mean, obviously it features, it, you can't really talk about the border in the last five years without mentioning the B word. Um, but it's certainly, um, this is not a Brexit project. This is not a project about Brexit. It's about a much, a much deeper um, time, a much longer period. And actually, where I began, it was much more of a his history and theory study. Um, it's since become a great deal more of a design project. Um, I think one of the things that I've really um, struggled with um, again and again, actually, and I think I still kind of wrangle with is um, the validity of me talking about a place that I'm not from. Um, and I think right, with, not, with good reason, perhaps, there um, would be, um, there's questions around that. There's kind of, there's some quite difficult questions around that that I think I have, some of the answers to, but I, I think there's, it comes down to a lot about how you begin to engage with a place. Um, I think I felt very strongly from the whole way through that this was not about me going somewhere and telling people in Belik, in Belku or in Black Lion, what I think or know about their border. Um, I am not proposing to be an expert in the big histories. And I'm actually in many ways interested in the situated knowledges, the site-specific understandings, and that kind of un, um, not uneducated, but like, I always talk about like my, the, the mum test with my mum, about how she may not have tried, she, she may not be doing a PhD in architecture, um, but she is an expert in space. We all are, we live in houses or we occupy different spaces in different ways all the time. And whether that is a articulated understanding, there is a real intimate kind of um, series of negotiations and knowledges that go on all the time. So I think I've tried to um, approach this whole thing with a, a very, uh, uh, what's the word? Like, a, I don't know, like not, not a sort of, um, a superiority of kind of proper academia. Um, I'm not, I find, I often find kind of proper academia a bit of a switch off. And um, I find some of the way that kind of works can be presented um, uh, quite boring to read sometimes, um, but not always, sometimes big words are essential, um, but also who, who is it for? And I think um, one of the principles um, of my thinking has been and continues to develop about is about how it kind of breaks down a history um, between the kind of historian or the practitioner, um, a public as broad or whoever that might be, and the kind of object of study. Um, so I began by um, trying to understand loads of Brexit, world trade organization, kind of all the stuff that we know is, is that is kind of totally boring for, for some, um, very complicated for everyone and fundamentally uh, futile and pointless as a whole exercise. Um, so I began to actually lurk in the border. That was kind of the best way I can begin to describe it. Um, I began to spend time there and it's, it's really difficult to get to grips with, I mean, how do you begin to get to grips with a 500 kilometer site? Um, it, how do you begin to get to grips or how do you even begin to enter a place um, that you, we think of a border, a border is something you cross. How do you kind of move along it? How does that change how you understand it? Um, how do you get into it? Um, how do you move around it? And those are kind of things I was thinking about. And I began um, by actually taking photos. I began driving the border, not walking the border. Um, and I began by, these are not my photos, these belong to uh, Wolfgang Hauschild, I think. Um, and began to um, drive along the border and actually I began to take a photo um, of every single road that crosses it, which I've now completed. 
which might seem like a, another kind of daft exercise along the lines of walking from Derry to Carlingford, but it actually gave me a task um, and a way of beginning to engage with a place and people in that place that I, um, and, and a reason for doing something, like a reason not, not just kind of sitting there waiting for the border to access me, it was about me going there and engage, engaging with it. I mean, we, the, we know, um, or we might know, you might, may or may not know some of the history of the border. The border, this border is, um, it's really strange. It's, it's unlike um, any other international boundary. Um, it's obviously divided the six counties of the north um, from um, here um, since 1921. Um, from moving from Lockfoyle all the way around to the Irish Sea. The reason it kind of, or part of the reason it follows the lines that it does here that we see between Monaghan and Fermanagh, I think that is at Lackey Bridge um, in the early nineties. Um, it, 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 it moves along kind of the boundaries of 17th century lordships effectively. So it's kind of a border that was drawn um, as a line on a map um, by um, the governments of um, the Free State and um, um, and the UK, um, and I don't think it was really. I mean, it, 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 to, to, borrow, to borrow Brexit parlance, I mean, there's one way we could think of it as kind of a fudge. It was it was it was done. I don't think anyone necessarily intended it to last um, as long as it did. Let alone kind of a hundred years next year. Um, and there were things like the Boundary Commission um, that were drawn up to kind of actually see about redrawing this boundary. There's bits of it that are kind of wildly impractical and there's bits of it that kind of continue to this day due to this unique relationship between history and geography and politics across these islands. Um, it kind of it, 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 it kind of it continues to kind of not make sense, even though for all intents and purposes for now it's practically invisible. Um, another reason why there's no other border um, like it in, in the world is the fact that um, since the Good Friday Agreement, the citizens of one state, Northern Ireland, um, are free to be able to choose the citizenship of the neighbouring state, the Republic, should they wish and should they identify with that state more. That is unlike anywhere else in the world. And it kind of moves through um, one of the most densely populated rural areas in Europe. I think the most densely populated um, rural area in Europe is also an Irish first, and it's Derrybeg and Bunbeg um, in Donegal. Um, but this network of roads that kind of crisscrosses the borderlands um, uh, means that it, um, uh, it, it, it just doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't, it, it's not intended to be a border. I mean, to give you some, uh, got the figure here, to give you some idea, the, Along the 310 mile border that is um, here in Ireland, there are 208 road crossings. Um, along the, the 3,720 mile eastern frontier of the European Union with Russia, Belarus, Moldova and Ukraine, there are only 137. Um, it, this kind of interweaving of two places um, was never intended to be such. Um, and even though there are distinct differences between um, here and the north, I think there are many similarities as well that kind of maybe aren't um, culturally. Um, and obviously, there, there, there are kind of um, this, this is a spectrum, but um, there, there are a lot, a lot, a, there's a lot that's the same as much as there's a lot that's different. Um, it was. It doesn't follow geographical features in the way that many others do. This, the border does not run across the Pyrenees. Um, there are not kind of ling or there weren't linguistic differences in the same way that you get with other countries. And nor and, and nor did it kind of a divide along natural economic ties. Um, Derry was cut off from its um, natural hinterland of East Donegal, uh, Clonus with Fermanagh, Newry with Louth, and and it it. it these kind of these these kind of things have began to shape in a longer term way, a kind of ricochet through the last hundred years, and have created kind of longer lasting um, issues and changes. I mean, to give you an example of some of the oddness, here we have um, the uh, the Murray family um, of Gordon Eden um, on the border between Fermanagh and I guess this is Cavan. Yes, it's near Ballyconnell, yeah. Um, and we have um, Mr. Murray, Mrs. Murray, their daughter, their dog is just kind of sitting there on the border. And, and this kind of division of the border through people's homes, um, um, it seems mad that this even happened, actually. I mean, I, I, it's still kind of, this kind of image still blows my mind. Um, 
every time I see it. And you can still see the house there today. The kind of the two story bit um, is no more, um, but that is the original cottage of the Murrays. And um, the, the other thing, you can actually see um, the, the, the biggest signifiers here of um, the border in everyday life, which are a, the road sign to kilometers just there, a petrol station, um, and you can actually see the line and the tarmac that kind of divides the two, ju two jurisdictions where one road um, builder ended and the next one began. Um, that really is John Murray, um, who was from Gordon Eden, who actually got featured in the Irish Times because through partition, particularly um, during the 70s, um, when the border became so much harder, um, they, their house was divided. In fact, their bed was divided in two by this kind of solid frontier. There were only 14 roads that you could cross the border with. Um, on um, at that time. So they to get their turf, um, which was in some fields down in Cavern, they had to go up to Derrylin or Enniskillen, then down through Swanland Bar, and then through this kind of long winded way around, kind of that just doesn't make any sense. The image, the kind of the half of the image that's on the left is actually from the Tower Museum in Derry. Um, and it's one of the, or it's a version of some of the maps the Boundary Commission drew. You can see those kind of uh, lighter dotted lines um, at the, either side um, of Derry, um, one going through Loch Swilly by Buncranagh and the other coming from Loch Foyle down, down towards Straban. Um, they were the kind of the limits of where the Boundary Commission considered um, of moving the border to or from. And they kind of went through all these different townlands working out the demographics. Um, of basically a kind of Catholic or Protestant, which are the two colors on this map. And they made these proposals of where to move it to. You can see the heavier dotted line is the actual border as it stands, um, which skirts around the west of Derry and then goes down the foil to Straban. They were proposing here to move it west um, over a part of Donegal called the Lagan, um, which is effectively um, the good land. Um, which is where there was kind of a, a Protestant um, uh, majority, as you can see from the colours on the map, um, and that was going to move to the uh, to the north. Now, another thing that kind of doesn't make sense was actually kind of misleading about these maps, which I find really interesting, is that um, the demographics in these maps they're presented as literally you cross a townland and suddenly you'll be in some um, Catholic or Protestant kind of idyll. Um, it's really not the case. It was very very much more intermixed. It kind of broadly kind of still is, and actually. A more accurate uh, way of reading it is probably through the contours. If you were able to see these maps through the contours on the map, the height and effectively again the land, that would probably give you a more accurate um, demographic representation. Another point here um, of interest is um, Cloncorric, which is, which is actually my mobile phone background quite um, depressing, not depressingly, um, maybe I need to get out more. Um, but this is a house just by um, what is known as the Dromulli Polyp, which is that weird loop um, in Monaghan, between Monaghan and family, near Clonus, um, where the border almost cuts back on itself. And that's somewhere where uh, there are no roads into that. Um, uh, it's not an enclave or an exclave, I forget which way around it is, but there are no roads into it, um, into the bit of the Republic that is almost cut off by this loop. You have to go around into, in through the North. And for a number of years, when kind of the border was kind of much harder, um, the births and deaths and christenings and whatever were not registered very quickly from the church in that district, in the Dromoli townlands. Um, this house here, which is just off the, it's the A3 in the North. I don't know what it is in, in the South, what end road it is. Um, between basically Clonus and Cavern. Um, this is a house where people sleep in their bed with their feet in the north and their head in the Republic. Again, these kind of weird kind of myths. Um, I hope they're true. Well, I don't hope they're true. I kind of, they're, they're kind of enjoyable in some way. Um, they're kind of weird in another way. And I almost don't want to know if they're true or false. Um, this is another one. This is down between, um, not far from Dundalk on the border with Armagh. Um, and this is kind of another kind of foible of the border in that it was called um, Benny the Goes or the Spike Hotel. And it was an old Shabine, um, uh, this kind of the, the, the tiled roof building really that you see there, um, it's kind of going back into the land, um, was a Shabine. But importantly, it had um, a door um, in each um, jurisdiction. So either the guards or the RUCPS and I, whoever, um, were not able to catch them because they just exit into the other country. So, but what do we even begin to call the border? I mean, this is something that I spent a significant amount of time um, 
thinking about, um, and I think it's important to think about, um, words and language, um, as I'm sure everyone is aware, um, really matter, um, particularly in relation to the border, Ireland, the North, um, places, um, what they're called, um, uh, there are politics attached to that. And I don't just mean that in terms of whether you call somewhere the North of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, the Occupied Six. I mean, in, even in terms of the fact that uh, so many of the place names, the common names for Irish towns and villages and townlands are in English. They are phonetic spellings um, or translations of the original Irish. Uh, the Irish kind of mean something. Um, Dira means the, the oak clearing in the oak grove, I think, but Derry is just a noise of an Irish word. It, 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 they, 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 can, they don't connect. And particularly in relation to the north and the border, the words, they act as kind of like a shibboleth. They kind of, they, they're a giveaway of kind of which side of the house you maybe stand on, if you do stand on either side of the house, um, um, for some more kind of further into each house than others, perhaps. But I think one of the things I've kind of been wrangling with is, I mean, whether, whether you even call it the Irish border. Um, and I don't think I do. I don't think I have been today. Um, um, obviously, from within Ireland, it's called the border. Um, we're already in Ireland. Um, that's despite the fact that uh, both on RTE and in the Irish Times, they do often call it the Irish border. Um, in the UK, it's called the Irish border. Um, um, there are other, I mean, but I guess when, when I was doing my walk, I kind of went through this one, uh, I stayed in this one B&B, and um, I was like, I've been walking along the border. And this woman um, said, oh, the Irish border. Um, and it, she said, you mean the British border? And I was like, mm-hmm. And um, she said, well, the Irish didn't put it there, did they? So there are these kind of um, strong positions and um, different kind of um, histories and understandings of place that I think are important to engage with um, um, and have a, an awareness of um, coming in. With that, though, um, I think one of the things that um, I've kind of struggle with again it was this kind of this trying to be comprehensive um in um uh what i'm doing now obviously um we all want to be rigorous we all want to be thorough we all want to do a good job and do somewhere justice in the, if you, in the case of like place-based research um but i guess i um given the uh politics and the histories that um, i've been engaging with uh, there's also the issue is that you literally can't um, be comprehensive because there is no one history. Um, uh, you'll be reading different books depending on different schools. You'll be taught different histories of the border. I don't know if this is true, um, but I was certainly told by someone, I haven't been there to check it out yet, um, or not recently, um, was that in the Ulster Museum, they were going to put um, a, a room uh, together of um, the conflict and um, no one could agree on it. Uh, or that the, the, there couldn't be an agreement and that wouldn't have like massive implications for obvious reasons. So they actually left the room empty. Um, I can't verify this because I haven't been, but that sounds like one of the uh, very strong piece of conceptual art that relates to kind of the, hit, the late 20th century and beyond Irish history. Um, I guess with the um, uh, nature of the border, um, I had to understand just as with walking that um, I was taking a route through the history and thinking about who, I mean, was I kind of doing a history of the border that was for an audience um, in England? Because there is kind of a huge amount of um, either willful or otherwise, or otherwise ignorance relating to kind of certainly Irish history and the border and understandings of the, the collective self of Britishness, certainly in England. Um, was I writing um, a history or working on a historical project of the border for somewhere else? And I had to come to the understanding that um, that I was taking, um, it was a line on a map and it was a, a, a route through a history. It was um, not trying to um, piece together an exact history because there is no exact history when it's so contested. And actually there was something strong in what I began to call alternative arrangements by, which is taken from the kind of, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, politicians in Westminster looking for alternative arrangements to the border. Um, 
but I wasn't taking it in their in their way. I was I'm taking it in a way that actually by actually drawing apart or shifting or extending or piecing together these kind of um, uh, positions and histories and um, ultimately architectures in different ways. Perhaps there's a way of drawing out a different history that gives creates a different space. Um, that might be um, uh, impossible. Um, I'm, I'm yet to find out. But it, in the spirit of people like um, uh, Walter Benjamin, the kind of the fragments that we piece together that kind of form part of his alter alternative arrangements um, uh, and what comes out of that. So. I began, um, so again, referencing the kind of the, net, the name issues. Um, I began um, investigating different sites through my walk and different histories that were contained in them, everything. And I think being very kind of um, broad in the kind of ones that I, I, I'm interested in, I'm, I'm equally interested in that Nadine and Girls Aloud as I am in um, the watchtowers of the British Army in South Armagh. And this place contains all those things. It's not one or the other. It's not just the troubles. There is, it's, it's not even just the border. The border's only been there for um, a relatively short part of this landscape's history. But I am interested in trying to get into the skin of it. And I began to do that, given that it's only been around 100 years through this um, series of kind of key dates. Now, this, this one actually here is looking at a monument in Gortoral, which I think is just on the northern side in Fermanagh, um, to the border busters, which was where people from all over Ireland um, during um, the, I guess, the early part of the um, Troubles, they would go and actually um, break down the concrete blocks of the, um, different um, blockades of the roads, of the back roads of the border, and they would actually re reconnect these communities up and down the border, even by like driving flatbed trucks um, into rivers to create bridges that had been blown up. Um, the kind of dates I began to look at, which I won't go into too much detail about, were kind of ways of kind of beginning to pivot or seeing how the border shifted or changed somewhat. Obviously, we know that it came into existence in partition. It could have been shifted through the Boundary Commission. Um, the constitution I found interesting and very savvy of the Doyle in that there was this kind of 12 hour window between um, uh, Edward the whatever's um, abdication um, and a new head of state, in which point the Irish constitution was rushed through, claiming in writing um, um, a, a kind of a territorial claim to the whole island, which hadn't existed before. There are ideas around the emergency and when part, villages like Pettigo in Donegal um, and Tully Homan in Fermanagh that border each other naturally because they are bridging points across rivers. And with the border being two thirds river or stream, a lot of the villages are bridging points because that's how places developed across rivers. One would have been in blackout and one would have been in light. So the border for a time would have been made out of light. And then gradually through kind of the hardening of the border through the militarization of it and then the softening of it through the nineties to kind of the end of Operation Banner which is the longest British military um, uh, expedition was the word occupation uh, like in history anyway. Um, uh, ended in 2007 and I didn't include Brexit because although I was trying to deal with it it just felt far too close and I couldn't really if I'm honest get my head around it I don't think I still can but I began to walk along the border um, starting in Muff just north of Derry um, and stayed in various B&Bs and pubs and people's houses um, along the way um, I made it my intention um, uh, not well I was doing this on my own. I was literally having to get from A to B um, in one go. There was no support team. Um, I had no one in the car to pick me up and drive myself to the nearest um, site of accommodation. Um, I literally had to get there by, under my own steam. And I kind of decided as much as I'm interested in the border as a line on the map, there's this kind of blurring of where you begin to feel the border. And I'm kind of almost as interested, if not more, of the Irish borderlands and what that begins to contain about these kind of differences beyond the line um, and the similarities as well. Um, somewhat annoyingly, although I think it's a great book, um, a guy called Garrett Carr, um, uh, just before I set off on this uh, walk, he published a book where he walked the border, um, which was, um, it took me a long time to be able to bring myself to read it actually. <laughs> um, but then I kind of realized, I mean, he's, he's from Donegal, he lives in Belfast, he's a poet, I'm not, he makes maps, I don't. And we undoubtedly will have totally different takes on and approaches and ways of working. So I think gradually I've had to become more and more confident is that it's, it's, you're not trying to ape someone, um, you're doing a different thing and, 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 and being led by the work and the place, I think that's begun to come out. Um, my walk then kind of went around the border across um, uh, about a month or just under a month um, 
And it originally I was meant to do it in the summer. Um, I actually ended up doing it in March 2019. Kind of a lot of the kind of same rhetoric we're hearing now around No Deal. Um, there was a real threat that this border could change, and there was even kind of this undercurrent of like, would we go back to the kind of um, violence in some form, which I think is 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 not the case, but um, it was certainly there, and it felt important not because of violence, but it felt important to do it before um, uh, the UK left the European Union in whatever form. Um, or before the border in its actual substance would change. I mean, obviously now we know the UK didn't leave then, the border hasn't changed, it's still effectively the same. Although actually, interestingly, um, the, Guardi check the Guardi checkpoints um, along the border due to COVID were one of the first times I think since the 90s where there has been any sort of presence on the border um, in that kind of way. Um, I kind of carried on um, across this month, up and down, um, starting in Derry, here we are, through Muff, um, through this is a former customs post um, and then before that former army base um, in Straban um, or through all these back roads um, where you could never really tell a lot of the time kind of which side um, you were on. Um, a lot of the time I was um, I was uh, fueled by hearty kind of full Irish bre breakfast or full Irish Brexit so one of my friends kind of kept on joking about um, and I kind of just spent the time talking to people a lot, just sitting in people's um, kitchens, having chats. And everyone was people who were living there as well were having the same kind of questions I was of what was going on. Um, this kind of place that they knew intimately, that they um, had grown up in or lived in for a long time, um, was on the front of the news every day. I mean, here's an interesting spot. The, 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 if you can see my cursor just down here, the border, this, this, the darker line is my walking route, the border here kind of wiggles through and actually comes to meet Loch Earn about here before jutting back up along this river through Pettigo, divided from Tully Hummond there. And at the time of partition, this kind of almost an enclave of the manor was totally inaccessible um, from the rest of it without either going a massive long way around through Belique, which was the most westerly point of the UK, um, or cutting through um, uh, Donegal. Um, then they began to actually kind of tweak and they began these other forms of infrastructure that come in to change that by the building of these bridges across Borough Island to reconnect this kind of almost other kind of island of Ireland um, back to the rest of, of, of the North. Here we are in Pettigo again, I'm just gonna flick through these a bit. And everywhere you see, you see these kind of, um, whether on both sides you see this, this architectural culture there's been obviously been an osmosis over hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years um, and slightly different kind of forms as you move along be that kind of bigger effects in some places from plantation and um, less so from others and um, some places are richer and um, some places are not and it kind of it kind of it wiggles through but there are a number of things particularly beautiful bungalows like this which I'm kind of beyond obsessed with and I guess with this kind of thing I think one of the things that interests me about the border um, is well, not specifically the border, but in this case, the border, um, is the way that we can look at these artifacts or these um, uh, arrangements or elements or fragments of, uh, of landscape and architecture that make the place up and actually treat them in a way that is worthy or considerate of, um, of them as of distinct um, uh, things worthy of study. Um, I think I'm fascinated by the way and the pragmatism almost of non-design that many of these um, buildings, probably the buildings that have had arguably the biggest effect on rural Ireland um, in the last hundred years, um, were primarily probably designed not by architects. Um, they were designed by, uh, I mean, local people, farmers, whatever. Um, and there were people making decisions, design decisions, whether they realised it or not, uh, um, that kind of um, we kind of maybe perhaps would overlook in some form now. And I was beginning to kind of piece all these together um, here in Monaghan, here's one in Monaghan um, uh, town, um, and beginning to think about how might I begin to kind of piece them together. And, and from this uh, walk, this is kind of the finish of the walk, um, ending on in the Cooley Peninsula, um, looking towards Carlingford Lock, just in the distance there. And I began to... Um, piece together all these, um, if you can see this still, um, uh, you, the, the, my kind of, I took thousands of photos, but I began to piece together all these elements quite intuitively. And I, I, I was like, okay, what, 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 what were my favorite bits? And I kind of, kind of went through all these photos and I began, ended up with this line of my route um, that kind of documents many of the different uh, uh, bits of building, bits of place of what I liked. 
and I somewhat in some and kind of a bit of, again a bit of an obsessive mad um, form I went through and with these 310 photos, um, one for each mile of the border, not my route, but the actual border itself, I went through and began documenting their, the date it was taken, uh, which state they were in the county, the townland, um, the townland in Gaelic, the um, translation of that back into English, and then going through things like the GPS coordinates of where I took that photo, and then quite kind of stream of consciousnessly what, um, what um, is in that photo. And this isn't kind of, um, I wasn't totally exhausting a place in the Georges Perret way, but it was beginning to give me a sense quite quickly um, of um, simply what the border is kind of made of. Um, here we have uh, this kind of bit of graffiti that you saw before. Let's look at this one here. Where are we? That's a particular tree. Um, here we have uh, this place in Fermanagh, Rossa, Rocker, Place of the Wood. And then if you actually take these coordinates here and you put them back into the map, uh, where are we? Okay, Marble Arch Road um, near Enniskill in BT92. You'll see the point where I actually took the photo, which is here. Um, the sign is no longer there, but you see where I walked along this road. All of it was pretty much a long road um, without the right to roam in Ireland. At some points, quite hairy roads that were actually quite main roads with high speed lorries. But these bits of buildings that I began to document, um, I guess I was interested in how um, they could kind of speak to certain bits of history. So I actually began to kind of count, I mean, how many times do these different elements um, come up? 45 in it, uh, bits of corrugated metal, 40, 40, 29 bits of cladding, uh, 15 gorse bushes, uh, 13 windows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nine, nine instances of rubble, nine of bog. And then I actually have another spreadsheet where I actually begin to go again of there's tarmac in all these photos, uh, there's uh, trees in all these photos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I have almost now this palette of borderness um, that I'm beginning to put together. And the next kind of phase of this really is that I begin to um, uh, take these elements of architecture and, and of landscape and begin to um, insert them um, back into the places, not necessarily that they came from. Um, and in quite a rough way here, you can begin to see how I was, this balustrade, I think it might have been even from that bungalow that I just saw, um, which was in Cavern, has been inserted here in next to um, the Black Pig's Dyke, which is this Neolithic earthwork, which was a kind of a, a form of enclosure um, that kind of roughly in parts, um, mirrors the line of historic Ulster. Um, here we're in um, Leitrim just between Kilty Cloha and, and Glen Farn. And I'm just interested in what kind of this unfixing or um, taking things out of place or unfixing bits of history and indeed bits of sites, um, what happens when they begin to be put together. Um, and this is very much work in progress still. Um, again, I began to kind of take bits of corrugated metal um, and clad, um, this is corrugated metal from somewhere near uh, where is it from? It's somewhere near uh, the Marble Arch Caves um, on a barn and I've kind of clad a bungalow here in Swanlin Bar to the point here where this, um, uh, somebody, um, I'm, they kind of believe that somebody had actually done this. I mean, I am no, by no means a Photoshop whiz, but um, they were like, oh yeah, Swanlin Bar, I can imagine someone doing that there. I was like, I, it's like, no, 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 this is me playing on Photoshop. And actually, I would love it if someone had done this, someone who committed to kind of embracing that kind of total um, individuality um, of kind of deciding that's what they wanted their bungalow to be. Um, here we've got a petrol station. For, I mean, these are quite silly as well. Um, a petrol station from Kilay, um, just on the border outside Derry, um, inserted back into um, a field um, just near Pettigo on the way to Belleek. Um, and uh, they kind of culminate, I, mean, in, I, I, I hope, in what's going to take place um, on the 3rd of May uh, next year, which will be the exact centenary of partition. Um, I'm hoping to, actually, well, I'm planning to, I'm interested in a bit of identifying and making these bits of architecture, bits of landscape um, here, um, somewhat absurdly sticking a bungalow. Uh, this is some, some crazy paving off a pub in Belturbet stuck onto a bungalow, a ruined bungalow in Cavern and then wedged into Sleeve Foy, um, just above Carlingford. Um, and I, I'm interested in kind of a kind of a hedge school um, and what kind of an informal environment where 
um, the places to converse or, or exchange, um, the kind of condition of the border, people to kind of um, uh, uh, unpack um, their relationship to it, be that at distance or afar. And I think especially that kind of the everyday practices, the unofficial histories, much more than the big heavy ones that kind of been mentioned throughout this presentation. And I think um, I want to draw attention. I don't, I don't know if I want to draw attention to the border. I'm not sure. I don't think that's necessarily helpful, but I'm interested into the conditions around it. Um, and this blurring of the borderlands. And I think the only way of doing that um, is by looking at it from a number of different positions, from a number of different sides. Um, and I hope I'm in the process of doing that. And I think I'll probably stop there. Thank you very much.